off. Um, just start with saying good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy evening and time away from your family at this time to join us for this webinar. I wanted to take a quick moment to go over some housekeeping before we get started. Everyone's muted by default, so we won't be interrupted by any latecomers, barking dogs, crying children, any of that. Uh, having done my fair share of corporate life and corporate calls, I know um, how those are when we work from home, and I assume a lot of you are calling in from home today. When uh, I'm talking or Anton is talking, uh, please write um, any questions Thing you have in the chat box and let me know if you can hear or see anything. That said, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. There is a separate Q&A box you can see and uh, please find that and ask your questions there because that just makes it easier for us to track the questions and answers. We will try to get to, uh, we will get to all the questions at the end of the presentation so we kind of stay on track with it. So that said, uh, let's kick this off. Uh, today you're here attending a presentation on due diligence and lending options for multifamily investment. I'm your host, Kavita Baratake. Uh, just a little bit about me, I'm the principal and founder of Cherry Street Investments, uh, where my mission is to help my clients create multiple passive sources of income so they can pur pursue their true calling and spend time on things that matter to them. I have a background in technology and have spent the last 19 years working in corporate roles in IBM and Atlassian. I'm now a full-time real estate educator and investor. As an educator, I work with busy professionals to educate them primarily on alternative investments uh, like real estate. As a real estate investor, I work on sponsoring uh, apartment investments with my partners and also work on some other asset classes like self-storage and senior assisted living with partners who specialize in those asset classes. I'm also a passive investor growing my own portfolio and uh, my passive income, and I'm always looking for new investment opportunities. Uh, that said, I want to briefly introduce our guest today, who's Anton Matley. Uh, he is the CEO of Peak Multifamily Funding. And uh, I'll just speak a little bit about him. Uh, see, uh, the Peak Multifamily Funding is a boutique financial intermediary that focuses on best finding the best financing for your multifamily properties, whether it's a new acquisition or refinancing. Uh, Anton has decades of experience in commercial and investment banking, private equity, and commercial real estate. After graduating from the Zurich Business School in Banking and Finance, he held senior management positions at major financial institutions in New York, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Zurich. He has managed cross-border teams, financed and restructured commercial real estate worth several billion US dollars, and overseen loan portfolios consisting of aircraft and ocean transport vessels. Anton has also directed the structuring of complex cross-border commodity and trade finance transactions for Fortune 500 companies. Over the last 15 years, Anton has been advising family offices, high net worth individuals, as well as private investment funds, facilitating their direct investments in commercial real estate across Europe and the United States, including several hundred million dollars in multifamily development and acquisitions. Needless to say, he is amazing and he has a wealth of information about multifamily. So outside of the office, Anton enjoys spending time with his family and is involved in various community and charity work. When not helping one of his clients with a multifamily, you will find him hunting down the best powder for skiing in the Rockies. Anton is fluent in English and German. So with that uh, um, introduction, I do want to personally say that I'm very grateful that Anton took time to be out here today because I know he has a busy schedule. Um, I personally met Anton a few um, earlier this year in one of the multifamily meetups. And I just felt like there was so much I could learn from him. And I always joke with him saying, every time I see him, I learn something I didn't know. So uh, with that, I want to hand over the floor to Anton. Hi everyone, thanks uh, Kavita for, for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. 
uh, th that accent uh, f uh, is not from East Texas, as I always say. It's from Switzerland. I was born in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, even though I have been uh, abroad for a big chunk of my life, uh, I was just leaving Switzerland too late to really get rid of that accent. So please bear with me. Uh, so as uh, Coedo has said, I'm, uh, besides uh, uh, doing mortgage brokerage uh, activities for multifamily properties, uh, uh, I have been personally involved with, uh, as an investor, direct investor, as a passive investor, as well as advising other investors. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, with uh, with today's topic uh, uh, for due diligence tips for uh, passive investors, I want to give a little bit of a spin from a from a passive investment perspective. Aaron was involved as well as what we see on a regular basis on the lending side where my view is that passive investors sometimes do not really get the, the full picture uh, when they just uh, listen to the webinars from, from sponsors and read the PPM and other marketing material. Uh, the reality is, I think, that uh, compared to uh, institutional investors that uh, know to ask all the questions and do their own due diligence, for pa private passive investors, it's sometimes difficult to really uh, get a sense of what uh, what is important. And obviously, we cannot touch uh, on much. Uh, I f usually talk about due diligence for uh, f for hours uh, and financing options for hours. And when it comes to analyzing a deal, just the numbers themselves, uh, we run through through a day just to analyze a single deal. So obviously we have to uh, stick to just a high level discussion, uh, but hopefully some of the topics that we are covering here will be valuable to you from a, a passive investor perspective. Uh, so maybe you can go to the first slide. Uh, now, I would like to touch on, on a couple of items. Uh, the sponsor in a deal is really the crucial piece. Uh, obviously, we want to touch on market, the property, the deal structure and capital stack, but all that doesn't really matter when the sponsor is not appropriate for the deal that you're investing in. You can have the greatest property and the greatest market. If the sponsor is not capable to run the property, you will still be in trouble. Uh, so that's sponsor uh, is, is the first slide that we'll want to touch a little bit more on. So if you can move to the next slide, uh, Kavita, thanks. Uh, so the experience of the sponsorship team uh, is is so crucial right and what we see in some instances where uh, someone may have done some single family deals or maybe 16 units or 20 units and then they uh, graduate up because they are now part of a syndication coaching team, move up to 200 units, 300 units, sometimes even more, without having done any property above the 100 unit mark. That is something that you should be concerned about if you invest with a team that doesn't have that, that experience of what they're presenting you as a new opportunity. Also, when it comes to the market, have they really been active in that market? We see a lot of instances where a sponsor, even an experienced sponsor in a particular market, whether it's in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, whether it's in Atlanta, Jacksonville, uh, Denver, it doesn't matter. Uh, when they move into a, a, another market uh, where they feel that they can replicate the model that they already know in their home market and just apply it there. And unfortunately, very often it doesn't work that way. Uh, one of the perfect examples is probably Dallas-based sponsors moving into Oklahoma and thinking that they can uh, apply the same rules there with uh, soft rehabbing, increasing the rents, and everyone, all the tenants will just say yes and do that. 
what we have seen over and over where that is just not happening in that particular market. That's just an example. So the sponsor experience in a particular market is really important. Also, the property class and condition is important. If, if someone doesn't really have the experience in a heavy value add, not a soft rehab, but a true heavy value add uh, transaction, they can burn big time, right? It's, a, it's one thing when you buy a property that is already stabilized uh, at the time of acquisition, and it's, it's strictly a soft rehab with the purpose to uh, spend maybe 2,000, 3,000 per unit on, on the rehab side, maybe even up to 5,000, including exterior, and then raise some rents. That is a relatively easy project compared to a heavy rehab that might be at 80% uh, vacancy uh, and or a property that is already quasi stabilized, but the sponsors uh, announce that they want to bring it from a C class to a B or even an A minus uh, status, which is much tougher to accomplish. So the knowledge of what they want to do is extremely important. Also the team roles, uh, uh, by the way, if, whenever you have a one person sponsor, then I would always be a little bit wary. And then you have to really consider what is happening if, if that individual cannot take that role any longer for whatever reason uh, that might happen in, in his or her life. Uh, but uh, assuming that you have uh, multiple individuals on the team, uh, what, look at what the team roles are and determine whether each individual's role is suitable for what uh, what that individual uh, should do. Time commitment, it's the same thing. If someone has already three or four deals uh, that they are offering and that they are uh, uh, having on the contract, I would be concerned about that because it's even when you have two or three people that are full time doing this, if you have three deals, let's say that you have under contract at the same time, it is a uh, it's very difficult to really focus on all three deals equally. Uh, so I would be a little bit concerned about that. Uh, financial strength, in my view, is also important. Uh, it's a little bit a touchy subject, right? Uh, and that is something that pa private passive investors tend not to ask sponsors because uh, they feel that they are just investing and uh, it's an on-recourse finance in, in most instances. So they have the view that it's not really that important. Over the past few years, it was not that important in most instances because deals were supported by one of the most favorable markets in multifamily we have ever seen in decades. Uh, once the market softens, uh, whether it happens uh, in a few months, whether it happens in a few years, who knows, but uh, the, the, the financial strength, if a situation gets tricky and the money raise may not be sufficient for whatever reason, knowing that the sponsors can support the deal themselves short term uh, and inject their own money if necessary is is a is an important uh, element and gives you much more comfort if someone doesn't really have that uh, then you have to ask what's going to happen are they going to get a, a loan from from the outside to cover the balance uh, or will they neglect the property and just decide that uh, they cannot handle it any longer? You do not know, right? But the, the stronger financially the sponsored team is, the more likely it is that uh, they will be willing to support it and able to support it even during a period of, uh, of, of stress. And Obviously, past performance is very important uh, that the sponsors can show. The problem that you are experiencing as passive investors in that syndication space is that the majority of all these sponsors have never gone through a downturn. So you do not really have 
many sponsors that can really prove to you that they're able to handle a property doing a downturn, right? So you essentially just have to look at whatever they have done and how they have performed, talk to as many passive investors in these deals as possible. And also do not look at just what has happened on deals that they already uh, were able to sell over the last uh, few years and more likely than not generate a significant return for the investors. But also if they have done more recent deals over the last year or two, whether they have been able to meet the performer as they originally have projected. Because we see now a lot of deals that were uh, uh, put online by sponsors over the last year to two years where the performance is below their performa. And if it is, it's not necessarily that you would have to say, I don't want to invest with them, but you need to ask why has that happened? Were they too aggressive in their projections? And in a lot of instances, they were, because we see that all the time when we see their underwriting that, that they are just too aggressive with uh, rent growth uh, or the income growth and or the expense reductions and very often it's, it's just not doable. So that's something that you have to really consider. Next slide, please. Yeah, good. Uh, so Besides the sponsor, obviously market is a, is a crucial piece. You can have a great property, but if the market is not right, uh, the property still uh, can be a big problem, right? Uh, uh, of the larger, uh, largest MSAs, obviously uh, Detroit is a perfect example, right? Uh, where if, if you have some sub markets within Detroit where people are fleeing, it doesn't matter whether you have a great asset there. So it's important to, to look at the size of, of the market, but also what is the population growth, uh, as well as what's the forecast. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult, but the sponsor really should provide you with, with some data points not just about the history, but also the forecast, right? There are a lot of sources, obviously the economic development of every city is more than happy to provide all the information of new employers that come into, into the city. Uh, they have comparison to similar cities and so on. And that also applies to employment history and forecast employer diversity. Uh, it's very important that you get a sense of that this is a place that uh, will have have a, a population growth driven by employment uh, that will help to, to fill your property that you're investing in, right? Now, household income is also very important. Sometimes uh, uh, sponsors just refer to the city's uh, household income or the zip code. The zip code can be too big really to be relevant. It's important that you really narrow it down to within a mile uh, of that property. Uh, people, particularly in C-class properties, they do not necessarily just move across the town uh, uh, they tend to be living as close as they can to family and their jobs. And uh, within their demographic environment, so even if maybe two or three miles away, the demographics look, look completely different. That is not necessarily applicable to that property. Poverty level, it's the same thing, right? When you look at zip codes, very often poverty levels are uh, or in a, at the reasonable level, but maybe closer in, to that property, pro poverty levels uh, might be much higher, which obviously then puts the question out there whether uh, you have enough of tenants that can pay the rent and whether they can afford, the, that there are enough uh, tenants that can afford rents, particularly when you plan to raise the rents. Crime, obviously it's always a big issue. Uh, the, uh, and home values uh, are also important because again, there the affordability comes in. If, if people are able to rent homes, right? Uh, it's not just whether someone can have a mortgage, 
and have a lower payment, but very often you also have homes that are being rented and if home rents are relatively close to, uh, to let's say a two bedroom or uh, a three bedroom at the property that the sponsors are presenting to you, these homes will compete with, uh, with, with, with that property. So that's important to understand where, where the home values are. Uh, at the property level, uh, it's f for you as an investor, what I, what I see a lot with these uh, investment presentations and PPMs that the information about the property itself is relatively limited. Uh, and for you as a passive investor, you really should ask to, uh, for as much information as you can so that you have the ability to analyze that deal for yourself rather than just getting high level uh, points and presentations from the sponsors. Right? Obviously, property and location class is crucial to understand. Do not uh, believe whatever is in the in the broker's OM when they say it's a C class or a B class. You need to determine that yourself when it comes to the property as well as to the to the location itself. Sponsors tend also to be a little bit too optimistic when t when it comes to to the to the class level. Uh, so it's important that you have a, a good sense yourself what what the true class is, that property as well as location. Uh, the OM, it's very important that you see that you usually have access to it, but I have seen deals where people didn't have access to it. The, the sponsor really should be uh, willing to uh, to show that. The same thing if you ask for a T12 and the rent roll, uh, ask for it and the sponsor should give it to you. If there is a need for a confidentiality agreement, have, have it signed, that's fine, right? But I personally would never invest in a single deal without seeing a T12 and a rent roll, right? It's, it's such a crucial piece. Uh, anything what a lender needs to underwrite the loan, you should see too. Right. So, uh, and clearly, a T12 and the rent roll is is a is a or two crucial elements there. Uh, physical vacancy. Sometimes the uh, the T12 does not uh, disclose that uh, they just have the net rent collections. It doesn't show you uh, the physical vacancy. It doesn't show you concessions. It doesn't show you loss to lease. It doesn't show you bad debt. That's a problem, uh, but you certainly at minimum we should should know what the true physical vacancy was over the last 12 months. If you do not know that, at least get some uh, uh, spots in over the last few uh, months where, where you get a sense of where the physical vacancy was. Uh, Non-recurring income and expenses, uh, going back to the T12, if, uh, the sponsors really should highlight that when they present the historical financials. Uh, and when you go through the T12 yourself, you should be able to spot some of these items. Uh, so particularly uh, when it comes to income, not that you have a sense of all that income looks really good, uh, but if there are some uh, income uh, items that are not really recurring, that that number is, is inflated, right? CapEx history is, is very important to understand too, uh, so that you have a, 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 a clear understanding of, of what the current owner has done to the property. And obviously crime history, once again, not just at the sub-market level, but what has happened at the property itself. And if there is a history of uh, particularly homicides, and assaults, but particularly homicides, it's it's important that you ask the sponsors what their plan is and whether they feel that they have a have a way to uh, to ensure that the property will not have uh, a, a major uh, crime issue uh, going forward. Crime 
uh, has, uh, has a massive negative impact on attracting tenants and particularly when you move in as a sponsor and want to increase rents you can rehab as much as you want if you have uh, a history of crime and you cannot present new tenants with with a with, with a clear picture look we are new owners we are uh, keeping crime at uh, at uh, uh, at as low level as possible, you will struggle to get quality tenants in there, which then has a massive impact on obviously on uh, on rent income and ultimately NOI. Visibility is is another item that is is really important. That uh, very often, uh, particularly newer sponsors, do not really truly understand what the visibility impact is of a property uh, and if it's a really bad visibility if it's hidden somewhere uh, and the marketing dollars that they have in their performer are, are just a tip, at the typical level you really should ask yourself and the sponsor why they feel that they can fill that property with with not a additional uh, marketing expense that they should spend Now, going to the uh, OM and sponsor performa, uh, you have heard that before, and I think everyone agrees that brokers uh, tend to uh, to push to the limit when it comes to to their performa, and you cannot really fault them. It's uh, every OM is is essentially. Uh, a sales pitch, right? So it's their job as brokers to present the property in the best possible light. Uh, it's the sponsor's job to really dissect it and decide what is feasible and what it's not. And frankly speaking, as a good sponsor, you do not really have to rely on the OM performa at all. And uh, you as a passive investor should not rely on it also, right? So when it comes to, uh, to some of the assumptions, it's really crucial to understand where the rank growth is coming from. Is that realistic? Uh, how have the sponsors addressed the physical and economic vacancy? Uh, we see, unfortunately, a lot uh, economic vacancy levels in though uh, some sponsors say we, we invest uh, 7,000 as an example per unit in, in rehab, we turn the property around, yet they still keep the economic vacancy even in year one at 10%. That is uh, just not realistic in most instances because you will have a, a significant higher turn to uh, tenant turn to clean up the property, and then also you uh, obviously have to to rehab these units. So to keep it at the ten percent is extremely difficult to do, even in the best markets. And if you have a, a a sponsor that claims that they can do it at that level you really need to understand how they have been able to do this with all the properties and how the comps are able to achieve this that have done a similar uh, turnaround uh, like the property they are presenting here capex budget extremely important what where do they plan to spend the money on so that uh, particularly when they want to push rents, whether it really goes into the into the right bucket, right? Uh, just replacing roofs does not really raise rents, right? Uh, uh, painting the outside helps a little bit with the curb appeal, uh, but ultimately you have to decide what the, where is the money spent that that actually increases the rents and is that realistic what the sponsors are presenting expense budget same thing again i touched on marketing expenses before uh, are there ex, uh, is their expense budget realistic uh, can they operate it at the payroll that they are claiming and uh, it's I would always ask whether they have a performa from the third party property management company that they plan to 
uh, to engage because that uh, property management company will be much more realistic when it comes to the expenses because they do not want to present uh, uh, below market expenses uh, to do a sponsor and then having to uh, to uh, come back after a couple of months and tell the sponsor sorry we couldn't achieve that. So they, uh, property prof true professional property management companies will come up with a performer that expense performer that's really realistic. Uh, one item that you also need to uh, focus on is uh, to make sure it typically doesn't happen with with syndicators out of the the, the, the common uh, uh, coaching groups but we have seen it where sponsors have buried fees in the performer just uh, watch out for that uh, that they are not paying themselves a, a, aside from acquisition fee initially but also as a management fee on ongoing operation where they may have some other fees buried in there. Uh, it's hard to detect, but sometimes uh, uh, it's still, uh, particularly when a particular expense item doesn't make sense to you, ask the question and hopefully you can identify whether it's uh, something that goes back to the sponsor or a related entity the sponsor also operates. Uh, when it comes to the going in and projected exit cap rates uh, and the valuations, this obviously is a, is a very hot topic. Uh, uh, generally speaking, sponsors are willing to, to be very aggressive, as you know, uh, with their acquisitions right now. So the going in cap rates uh, tend to be very low. Uh, but uh, the re reality is, right, the, if there is a true upside, uh, the going in cap rate might be still okay. Uh, and if they are able to, uh, to perform the business model to create the value that they are claiming that they can uh, create, I would be much more concerned about the uh, exit cap rate, the projected exit cap rate when there is a capital event, whether it's a refinancing in th year three or a sale in year five, whatever it is, whether the cap rate that they are using at that point is really realistic. Right? So similar to the rank growth, if they, you can uh, create a, a great performer with great returns just by, by these two items, rank growth that you inflate and the cap rate that you, that you keep artificially low will, create, will on paper provide great returns. So be very wary of, of cap rates and valuations on the exit side or capital event side that are likely very hard to achieve, right? And with that, compare it with similar deals that you have seen in that market, right? That is really one of the, the best ways to, to see uh, whether, whether a sponsor is, is going way above uh, their, their order deals uh, have been done. Uh, and on top of that, uh, ask for stress tests. Uh, have their own stress tests as sponsors. They really should have done it and they should present them to you. Uh, but if they haven't done it, I would be concerned. Uh, in any case, you can run your own stress test, right? As long as you have your uh, your T12 and rent roll and their performer, you can run your own stress test. But it really should be up to the sponsors to at least present you with a, with a couple of stress test scenarios so that you do not even have to run them to yourself. The deal structure itself, uh, I would always ask for organization chart. Uh, obviously, you cannot ask for organization chart that shows shows all the the passive investors. That's not relevant to you, but it should show you who are the the various parties on the GP side that are involved in that deal, uh, so that you have a clear understanding of of how the deal is structured. Uh, Usually with the syndication groups that are part of a, of a coaching program, they use the, uh, uh, the, 
lawyers that that have been doing this for a long time so there i wouldn't be that concerned uh, but there are some so indicators out there uh, that are doing uh, structuring these deals in a more unconventional fashion and you really want to have, get get that picture early on so that you all can be comfortable with with the way they structure these deals uh, obviously acquisition fees asset management fees that they are charging uh, is extremely important to understand that needs to be fully disclosed uh, so that you have a clear understanding what uh, what uh, the sponsors are getting in in cash uh, compensation initially as well as ongoing before uh, before uh, any of the free cash flow is available for distribution right uh, some people feel that uh, asset management acquisition fee should be uh, minor or should be not at all uh, in the picture some also feel that asset management fees should be extremely low my view is if you have a, a good sponsor you want to compensate them so that and that they have an incentive to do the work right so uh, if a deal cannot be supported uh, by uh, appropriate acquisition and asset management fees then it's really not a good deal right because if you look at at institutional level investments there is always an acquisition fee and always an asset management fee and these deals still need to work so the same real the same principle really should apply to to these private syndication investments too uh, is there a preferred return uh, some deals have preferred returns others do not right uh, you have to ask yourself too and that comes back to the financial strength of the sponsors if they offer a preferred return uh, are they able to operate just based on the asset management fee over a year or two right initially the preferred return will likely just go to the to the uh, will be possibly just a crew so there is not necessarily a cash event that means that the sponsors themselves also do not see cash maybe for a year maybe for two years particularly if it's a heavy lift so are they able to sustain themselves just with with the asset management fee during that period because the last thing you want is that they are uh, getting into financial distress so that is particularly when there's a preferred return that would be would be uh, a little bit more wary of the financial strength of of the sponsors split uh, obviously you have to ask yourself is everyone fairly compensated that's uh, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder right some feel uh, very different than others but it's more from your perspective do you feel that it's a fair compensation and then if you feel yes then move ahead with it now one of the uh, the crucial questions that you really have to ask is how is the free cash flow doing operations applied why right? is it is it a, 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 a cash return uh, without impacting the capital account or your personal capital account as a passive investor or is it reducing your capital and the reason why that is so important is is at the end when there is a capital event whether it's a refinance or a sale what at that point is that split going to look like right let's say if it's an 80 20 split but that 80 20 split is not based on the initial capital contribution but at the capital uh, level at the time of that uh, refinance or sale obviously if the, that preferred return and or other cash distributions were applied to reduce the the capital account uh, your actual capital balance will be much lower and if the split is applied based on that uh, uh, percentage that is still in there you will be 
at uh, at a disadvantage. So uh, we uh, just watch out for that in uh, in the in the agreements that you sign that you have a, that is initially offered, but also what you sign that you have a clear understanding. And lastly. As always, what are the passive investors' voting rights? Right, uh, when are you able to uh, to uh, to make a decision when you see that things are not going right? Do you do you need uh, two thirds of all passives that need to need to uh, agree to something? Is it fifty percent? Is it seventy five? Uh, it's important to understand. Uh, when it comes to the capital stack, obviously uh, we have the senior debt, we have the equity in a senior equity in a typical deal. Uh, the proposed leverage is really very crucial here because the the higher the leverage, obviously the less of a cushion there is in the deal. And uh, whether it's good or bad, that's always up to you to decide. Uh, but uh, you need to really feel comfortable with the leverage that that is being proposed. And one of the measures, obviously, is whether the in-place debt service coverage or debt yield uh, with normalized expenses is going to look like, right? And that's the really the going in based on on the T12, uh, particularly the T3 collections and the T12 expenses all normalized for you as a new investor. How does the debt service coverage look like? Will it just barely make it at the 1.25 that we typically see with, uh, with agency loans or does it have more of a cushion or not? Uh, and how does the debt service coverage uh, or debt yield look like uh, at that future capital event, whether it's a sale or a, uh, or a refinancing? Is the debt typical for, uh, uh, for, a, for a deal like this? Right? Uh, obviously, if it's a more or less stabilized deal, uh, very often we see it to go into a Fannie and Freddie loan. Uh, if it doesn't uh, make it quite into a Fannie and Freddie, sometimes it's a CMBS or it might be a bank loan. If it's uh, not stabilized enough, then obviously it goes into a bridge. Uh, and you have to ask yourself when they say we do a bridge loan, is it really because it, it needs a bridge loan? Uh, or is it because they want to uh, to have a maximum leverage uh, and the, naturally there is an incentive to have a bridge loan in place even for a stabilized asset because you need to raise less equity and if your plan works out on paper again you you will have much better uh, a much better return for you as passive investor as as passive investors as well as for the sponsors so there sometimes is an incentive for for sponsors to push uh, the deal into a bridge loan in order to get the the, the maximum leverage and uh, sometimes it happens right uh, we, we see it on a regular basis where originally a lender says we are going for 80 percent of leverage with an agency loan and then they present it to fanny and freddie and fanny and freddie come back and say well we can only do 65 percent leverage as an example as an extreme case and uh, sponsors obviously at that point are kind of forced to move into a bridge loan because they already have spent all the time assuming that it's a, it's a Fannie or Freddie loan and they just do not have enough time now to to, to, to look for an, another option like a CMBS and hope that it will, will get up to a better leverage. So that happens uh, and that's more kind of a backstop action. Uh, where you just have to uh, essentially live with it. What is important is that you understand when that happens and that the sponsors communicate it to you. But that is different from a situation where a sponsor right out of the gate 
essentially wants to go into a bridge loan, so just that they keep the equity as low as possible and then hope that they can refinance into a permanent loan maybe one or two years out. Obviously, the experience of the mortgage broker and lender are crucial. Right. Uh, if uh, if you have a mortgage broker that is uh, is doing everything and uh, does multifamily uh, besides uh, uh, offices, hospitality, and so on, uh, you have to wonder whether you really have the uh, that in that knowledge of multifamily uh, debt structures uh, with a lender. Uh, Typically, when you go to uh, to the agency lenders, they have uh, obviously multifamily experience. Why that's why they are agency lenders uh, to begin with. So they have the multifamily experience when it comes to these uh, these two loan uh, uh, providers, whether it's Fannie and Freddie. Uh, that does not mean, however, that they have experience with a particular market and a particular uh, class of multifamily, right? So you have, there are quite a number of, uh, of uh, agency lenders that are perfect for class A properties. We go to uh, at the preferred level. We always go to them because we know that they do an extremely good job uh, with extremely aggressive pricing for class A properties for, for very strong sponsors. And usually these deals are done at the 60 to 65 leverage, right? So these lenders are perfect for that type of, of segment. However, that would be terrible to, uh, to even think that we could do, they could do a good job when it comes to a class E property uh, for a syndication, uh, uh, for a syndication sponsor. So it's important really to uh, ask whether that lender is appropriate. Now also ask the sponsors early on that they, they need to dis should disclose it, uh, but it's important still to ask whether they plan to put any mezzanine uh, debt or preferred equity uh, into the picture. Again, the direction there is is that you uh, you uh, have someone who has uh, a, a capped compensation, and that you potentially can take out as a sponsor uh, group after one or two years if the deal goes really well, and the senior equity holders have uh, because that percentage is much smaller, the return looks much better. Uh, something we do not really see that much with typical syndication deals, but once in a while we see it, and it's important that you understand if if the sponsors uh, go with that strategy. Another important uh, aspect that you really need to to be aware of if if the sponsors target a very significant passive investor, and that happens quite a bit when. Uh, less experienced sponsors go out and attempt to do deals that are well above of their experience level and investor network level. Right? We have seen deals uh, from sponsors that have attempted to take down 40 million to 50 million dollar deals. Uh, they and their coaching group network could never support a deal of this size because they had to raise 10 million to 50 million uh, in equity for these deals. So what they attempted to do is to go reach out to, to a private equity fund uh, and uh, get a big chunk of, of that equity uh, for 80% or sometimes in 90% from a single source, right? Now, in theory, that works well. In practice, it doesn't because these private equity groups initially always say, yes, we are interested. So then the sponsors, because they have not the experience in that, in that field, uh, are tempted to believe that now they have an equity source that provides them 90% of the equity until that source then comes back to them much later in, in the uh, in in the deal, 
re relatively close before closing and tell them so we don't have a, we 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 are not now not interested because we we have reviewed the deal we feel that u.s sponsors are not strong enough or we don't like this and we don't like that whatever it is uh, but we have seen multiple deals go sour because of that and the sponsors have lost uh, in in all of these deals that we have seen have lost hundreds of thousands in hard money uh, so for, for you as a passive investor just be aware when a when a sponsorship group is taking a, down a deal that is well above of what what they likely are able to handle with their own uh, uh, private investor database uh, because uh, very often these deals will will be uh, cannot be closed and obviously if you are being asked to put up hard money for these deals you should be particularly wary to do that right uh, now uh, Obviously, when it comes to closing costs, reserves, escrow, and so on, it's important that you really have a complete understanding of what all these costs are and that the sponsors are also accounting for it, right? Uh, not just the typical closing costs, but also the reserves, uh, escrows. Uh, if you have uh, a lot of rehab that, that needs to be uh, done to the property uh, and even if it's being financed by the lender uh, the sponsor needs to account for the fact that these funds will be in escrow and ultimately will be released but the money needs to be spent from another source first before the lender releases it uh, if you're a very experienced sponsor and you have uh, a long track record some of the contractors are willing to wait for payment until the lender pays them directly, but particularly newer sponsors do not have that track record. They will need to pay these contractors before they even get the money back from, uh, from the lender. So they need to account for that additional capital that is needed. And obviously also, do they have enough operational reserve? Uh, so we see uh, we have seen uh, regularly deals where the money raised was not sufficient to cover all the rehab and all, and then the uh, the operational cost, which then resulted in the property not doing all the rehab that they were supposed to do, uh, and ultimately the property. Uh, was was sold still for a profit uh, in most instances there were some exceptions but in most instances but the only reason why they were selling it still for profit was because the market helped them tremendously over the last few years as a market softens all these sponsors would be in in deep trouble and so it's important particularly in the current environment that you are really comfortable with the money that they're raising also do have an off, off of a cushion uh, if things do not go, go exactly the way they anticipate. So these are just uh, the most common multifamily lenders for syndications. There are many more, right? Uh, we, we do a lot of bridge loans. I do not mention that here because it's really, it, it just goes into too much detail, but uh, in most instances, for very small deals, uh, uh, it's very often a bank that provides the financing. For all the typical stabilized deals, it's a Freddie Mac or it's a Fannie Mae loan. Uh, as you have heard, uh, undoubtedly, you get great leverage up to 80%. Naturally, in some markets, you will be capped at 65 because of because they are... Fanny and Freddie do not want to go higher and or because the debt service coverage just doesn't support it. Uh, interest only, just for your information, if a sponsor comes to you now with a deal and they claim, oh, we get up to five years of interest only, right now it's extremely tough to, to achieve uh, uh, because Fanny uh, and in, in in response also Freddie have scaled back on the interest only uh, waivers very significantly over the last uh, month and a half. So if a sponsor comes with comes back to you with these aggressive interest only proposals, 
be wary of it because it's uh, it it would not be a surprise if uh, ultimately they only get one year rather than the the three four or five years that they have uh, ultimately presented to you. So it's just something that you uh, should be aware of. Uh, so I don't really want to go with too much into into the, these lending programs because there are uh, so many. But but I would say if uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just reach out to me or in the Q and A uh, afterwards. I'm I'm happy to answer specific questions you have when it comes to uh, specific loan programs. So, Kavita, uh, I Abby. think that, so. Abby. I think we we covered all. Uh, uh, okay, all the slides. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anton. That was a wealth of information. I know I have a lot of questions, and our view listeners do have as well. So, are you able to see the open questions in the Q and A box, or do you want me to read it out to you? Uh, let's see. Q and A. Let me open it. Okay. Uh, so the first one is uh, Madhavi uh, asks, under current market conditions, are you cautious of underwriting? Do the forecast imply downturn in market condition? What resources a broker do you use for market forecast, market data? Can you share the reference links after webinar? Uh, uh, for market forecasts, uh, we, we are a mortgage broker, right? So uh, we uh, we use sources like CoStar, Yardi Matrix, as well as other uh, sources. But ultimately, uh, we also cooperate with the various lenders and come up with with what we believe are are uh, are accurate forecast for particular property like we are looking at the deal right now uh, down in Houston where uh, the property management company came back with uh, with with uh, rent uh, a forecast for that property where we felt uh, it was too aggressive based on the comps that we have seen and the lender has seen. So we went back to the property management company and asked them for, for more details, how they were able to come up with that. So in that particular instance, they were able to provide additional information from other properties that they uh, are currently operating and essentially were able to tell us, look, these comps that you have, uh, are really outdated here are the real numbers right so uh, it's more a kind of a, a an art uh, than science when it comes to uh, to to that because very often uh, co-star and the Audi and all the other sources are not always uh, completely accurate right uh, when it comes to uh, ultimately, the true decision making it is always the appraisal that that is driving it. We spend a lot of time in negotiating with the appraisers when it comes to expenses, when it comes to uh, valuation. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what I can tell you is one appraiser will have a different opinion f from from the, the next one, and that one has a different opinion from the other. So it's unfortunately, there is no, uh, no clear answer to this. Uh, so we, we essentially just attempt to get as close to, to the truth. Uh, of what we believe a majority of, of appraiser and lenders are, are, are willing to believe is going to happen with a particular property and market. Uh, so now, when it comes to the question to the, uh, are we more cautious in the underwriting? I would not uh, really say that that is happening, right? We, we as brokers, we obviously push our lenders to underwrite as aggressive as they possibly feel comfortable with. Uh, overall, I would say 
uh, lenders are still pretty aggressive in, in their underwriting uh, as they were in the past. Uh, but what, what you need to recognize is that most lenders really look at the in-place uh, numbers rather than just your performa. Now, when it comes to the bridge loans, there we only see, and that's the only exceptions, there we only see uh, uh, lenders being less aggressive than they were in the past. I would say until six months ago, we virtually for every deal uh, that went uh, under bridge loan, we were able to to find a bridge lender that was essentially taking the the performer from the sponsors and the property management company as is without challenging it. Now we have many more instances where a bridge lender pushes back and says, "I think you are too aggressive there." So, if for that only we can say the underwriting has become more cautious. Um, a quick follow-up question to that, Anton. What are some of the free resources that uh, that our uh, uh, passive investors can use for, um, pa you know, population, employment growth, and things like that to to look them up? I know yeah. I've used city da city hyphen data. Uh, do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, obviously, city hyphen data is uh, is the Neil Baba. Uh, go to Ryan. Uh, a data source. Uh, I would say also the uh, census.gov uh, mm -hmm. data has, has a, a massive amount of, of information. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to local data, the best one really is to, to, uh, to look uh, for data that is being provided by, by the economic development uh, of a particular city. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they uh, they they obviously need to study this in very uh, much detail, and they not that you just take whatever they tell you, but very often they give you data that is backed up by all the data that they have have pulled from somewhere. So they are a great source without you having to essentially attempt to find information. Uh, now also. Uh, sometimes ask uh, the, the sponsors whether they have a co-star report or a yard report uh, usually they have it either they subscribe to these services directly or they get it from a broker right so essentially any sizable deal uh, the sponsor should have one of these two reports uh, because they are only uh, uh, given to them by by the brokers and uh, I would ask for that so that you at least have when it comes to, to the property itself and the market as it's presented by, uh, by CoStar in the Audi that you have a, have a general picture there. But when it comes to general uh, employment forecasts and all that, particularly the forecast side, that's much harder. And that's where I really would just Google it as well as go to the, the, the city and ask for as much information as you can. Uh, we, we have a lot more questions to go through and I assume people yeah. are going to stay on. If they drop off, that's fine. Um, Anton, are you okay on time to go through sure. the rest yeah, of the questions? Fine. Okay. So uh, I think the, the other questions were around, uh, what do you recommend like people look for when it comes to the asset and acquisition fees? Is there a general rule of thumb for those numbers? I mean, I'd say one to three is what I've seen for both of those, but what is your, um, what, is, what should the investor look for? Yeah. Uh... I would say that's probably in line with, with most deals. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it also depends on the size of the deal. Obviously, the smaller the deal, uh, the more appropriate it is to, to have a higher percentage. And the larger the deal, the, the more that, that percentage should, should shrink as a, as a general rule. Uh, I would just uh, uh, kind of uh, make sure that, that all the interests are aligned, why right? besides the asset uh, acquisition fee and asset management fee, I would also ask whether the sponsors invest uh, some money themselves, right? Uh, generally speaking, while in the past, uh, a lot of lenders uh, did not require sponsors to invest their own money. 
uh, now it's it's a, it's a pretty standard that uh, it's expected that they do and they require that they do. Uh, so obviously they have uh, also that interest uh, from as a as an investor at hand as a cash investor. Uh, but when it comes to the, the acquisition and asset management fee, particularly when it comes to the asset management fee, you always have to ask yourself, if I did the asset management myself, uh, would, I, uh, would I feel that I get properly compensated for that work, right? And if you say, no, it's really not enough, then you have to wonder whether the sponsors have the same view and if the deal does not perform as well, whether they take the the, the eyes off the, uh, the the play here because they feel that they do not really get much uh, compensation to spend all the time on, right? right? If it's the opposite, you should ask the same thing. Well, this is this is really a a steep compensation, right? And we have seen some some groups that, that charge up to 5% of asset management fee, right? And then you really have to wonder whether that is appropriate. But I would say one to 2% is, is pretty common and it's only uh, perfectly acceptable. Right. And what is, uh, do you expect a particular percentage of skin in the game as far as the sponsor is concerned? Uh, Off from the race. A, from, well, from a lender perspective, I would say for, for a typical deal, uh, they expect uh, around 5% uh, of cash contribution. Uh, in some instances, particularly when you're newer and if it's a tougher deal uh, in a tough location, uh, they may ask for, for more. We have, we have uh, done deals where the lenders required to get them all the way to 20% because it was such a hairy deal and they didn't really have that experience in that type of, of asset and that market. But as a general rule, it's somewhere for a stabilized asset, it's around 5%. And if it's a really hairy deal, it's typically around the 10% mark. And for you as a sponsor, as a, as a passive investor, uh, I would say that's that's probably what you would want to see that the, the sponsorship group as a as a whole, obviously not each individual in the group, but as a whole have have I would say somewhere around five percent uh, in cash invested in that deal. And also from a DSCR perspective, is there a certain, I know the minimum for the lender is 1.25, but is there a certain recommended number that you like passive investors to see when they're looking at a deal? Obviously, the higher, the better, right? Yeah, the higher, the better. Uh, realistically speaking, with the syndication deals, uh, it usually just barely makes it to the 1.25, right? Uh, and sometimes, depending on market, it's 1.35 or, so, or even higher. But uh, when again, when we look at the typical market, uh, markets uh, at the 1.25, uh, sponsors are typically attempting to maximize the leverage. And if they can get to the max max leverage, it will be just barely making it to the to the 1.25. Uh, from a lending perspective, I won't, won't, really wouldn't be too concerned about that. And as an investor, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Uh, as long as the projections are not too aggressive and. Uh, uh, you essentially feel, well, I get a great deal here, uh, and ultimately your your return will not be nearly as high as they originally projected, right? So it's less the debt service courage that you should be concerned about going in, but more whether whether the return projections are really realistic, right? Remember the lender will. Uh, has has a cushion of of that uh, twenty five percent right roughly out of the gate, uh, while you as a as an equity investor uh, do not have that cushion right. So uh, it's just something that uh, that uh, as a passive investor, uh, it's you 
when you have particularly a, an agency loan, you already know that there is a cushion in place, right? But that cushion on the loan side does not guarantee that you ever get your projected returns as an investor. So I would be much more focusing on, on the projections in terms of rank growth, uh, and then also valuations for the exit, whether that is really realistic or not. So you certainly have that protection, particularly when it goes with an agency loan, that there is at least uh, a reasonably sufficient amount of, uh, of, uh, of cushion there when you start out. Okay. And I think there's a question about uh, what is um, a what percentage of the deal is a typical closing cost reserves, et cetera. Are these required to be a specific percentage by the lender? Uh, well, some some uh, items have to be escrowed, uh, depending on the program, depending on the deal level. You uh, may or may not have to escrow some property taxes, some insurance. Uh, so that can vary from, from deal to deal, but usually you have some uh, uh, taxes that need to be escrowed as well as insurance. Uh, when it comes to uh, rehab uh, money, it depends uh, essentially whether it's being financed or not. If it's being financed, uh, it usually has to be escrowed. Uh, when it comes to overall closing costs, it depends a little bit on the deal side for smaller deals. I would say probably should count it at around three to four percent. If it's a larger deal, it might be just one and a half percent, two percent. Right. So it really depends on the deal side because some costs are are fixed and some costs are 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 size dependent. Uh, so I would say it's anywhere typically from somewhere one and a half to four percent depending on the deal size. Perfect. Right, and but that's different from also when you have operational reserves that you put into place yourself as a sponsor, that's completely separate, right? And that's, I touched on that earlier, that is something that you should also ask as a passive, uh, what, what is that amount that they plan to put uh, Plan a race that is very specific for operational reserves. Yes, that does exclude prepayment penalty. Yes, so that's now a, 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 an order very good uh, point that you bring up. Right when it comes to the exit, uh, have they incorporated the prepayment penalty in their exit calculation? Right. Uh, the the more experienced sponsors. Uh, tend to do that, but we still see it once in a while where they uh, come up with their projections and they they prepay their uh, their Fannie loan, uh, Freddie loan at, uh, in year four or five, and somehow they don't have any prepayment penalty. Right? <laughs> so uh, uh, that's a very good point uh, that obviously uh, can negatively impact the returns quite a bit. Okay. Uh, there's a question about the fees and splits in new development versus existing value add opportunity. Uh, what should a passive investor expect in the two cases? Well, they are not really, uh, first of all, there are no rules, right? Uh, now, when it comes to new developments to be Fair. There are uh, there are a couple of sponsors that are now moving into new development uh, projects. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I would say just uh, as a private investor, you want to have a significantly improved compensation uh, with a new development because you essentially agree to get into a deal where you will not see any any cash flow whatsoever for at least two years, usually it's three years plus. And for that development risk that you essentially are taking, you should be receiving a much higher compensation compared to a property that is, uh, is cash flowing or even partially cash flowing out of the, out of the gate. Uh, when it comes to the splits, it it can vary tremendously. Uh, 
in somehow in that syndication space, it's uh, it's always somewhere in the 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30. Uh, in a lot of other instances outside of the syndication space, there are a lot of deals that that we see that have 50-50 splits. Right? So there are no real rules there. Uh, ultimately, what what is important is that uh, that your overall return as a passive should essentially match the the risk that you are taking. Right, and uh, that is another element where I think in the private syndication space that risk-adjusted return, unfortunately, is not a topic that is being touched on whatsoever. Uh, and that, in my view, is, uh, is is something that really all these coaches out there should should touch on much more. Uh, like for a, for a ground up development. It's uh, the risk adjusted return needs to be higher, right? Because there is no cash flow there. If it's a, a class A property in a top location, naturally the return is lower because it's from a risk adjusted perspective, it's uh, it it bears less risk than a C class property in a D D location. Uh, that is something that I think is is largely missing in the in the in the private syndication space, but for you as passive investors, I think that is something that you should be aware of whenever you look at the deal, right? It goes even not just ground up versus existing properties, even uh, taking Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth compared to a tertiary market like in Waco or uh, or Wichita Falls, uh, Morello, Abilene, and so on, and when we just sticking to Texas, but it's applicable in any other market too, uh, your return should be better in, in these tertiary markets because you take that market risk, right? And uh, as long as you recognize it, it's fine, but it's really not fair to compare a Dallas or an Austin property with a, with a tertiary market property acquisition. Yeah, I think I have some questions about that too, but I think we have all so many questions for you, Anton, that we yeah. probably <laughs> won't get to all of them today. So I request people to send me an email with their questions and I'm happy to, or just email, um, send me a list of questions so we don't all send them to Anton and bug him with a lot of emails. Uh, I'll try to compile a list and get them answered and share it with everyone. So that way everyone will learn as well. Um, Thank you everyone for joining. I think there was one more question left, which is very detailed to answer. Like it was about rehab strategies, amenities and branding efforts, which have particular success. And I'll uh, ask uh, Anton offline about this. I know I have like four or five questions just from this presentation with him. Uh, I think this was a wealth of information. Thank you so much, Anton. I can't thank you enough. And uh, people do appreciate your patience and um, sharing your information with us. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, it was wonderful. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you everyone for joining. Please send me that email. Uh, I'll make sure your questions are all answered. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.